Japan with Marwa Osman, who's just returned actually from a trip to Venezuela where you were observing, um, uh, sorry, where you were observing um, the election results there. Um, very quickly, uh, just tell us how that trip went and how you were received as uh, somebody from uh, obviously the Lebanese resistance. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for having me, dear Vanessa, on your uh, platform. And um, the trip to Venezuela was absolutely amazing. The only thing that was left for me to do is go with a friend like you and we would have a blast. Mm. But uh, it was actually uh, a very important trip uh, at the level of um, education, educating myself as to what Venezuela mm. is and how the system works there and what the people are and how they react to imperialism, to the sanctions that has uh, been imposed on their country, illegal punitive sanctions against their own country by the United States of America for simply saying, no, you are not allowed to come and steal our loot, our resources, or uh, put puppet governments uh, to uh, uh, in our establishments and in our institutions. So it was very important for me, just as the trip to Cuba was very important to me two years ago. So these these trips, because we look, Vanessa, we have a connection uh, here in West Asia with the uh, liberation movements across the world, and the most important liberation movements that actually affected a lot of the Arab uh, Israeli struggle. In the 60s and 70s was the uh, Bolivarian Revolution and the uh, the movement that was created by Fidel Castro and by uh, Che Guevara and by many others who were inspired by uh, José Martí and by uh, Simón Bolívar and all of these very important people throughout history for Latin America. So it's it's important for us to learn uh, what they have experienced throughout the years and to uh, try to transfer the knowledge that they have uh, accumulated all of uh, over all of these decades because uh, sanctions is something new to our region. It's relatively new to Syria, for example. It's been uh, there for the past uh, 10, uh, I think, 8 to 10 years. It's uh, not very new in Iran. It's been there for the past 45 years, but it's been imposed on Latin America way before that. So, And uh, the regime change and color revolutions uh, and the, the, the actual catalog of um, – creating uh, of creating coups uh, havoc uh, revolutions anti revolutions and uh, uh, color revolutions in in the process of regime change was the first chapter of it was latin america by the united states of america so it is very important for us to learn firsthand at the that that's the most important thing the second thing is um, every time there's some sort of a democratic process that happens in one of the countries that are usually uh, foes of the United States of America and NATO, uh, the first thing that happens before even election season comes along is you have a long pieces, opinion pieces by usually either very important experts. And the, this importance is uh, bestowed upon them by the West, not by how really uh, effective their work is or whether or not they're, they really have published research papers and those research papers where people Peer reviewed and it's not about that it's about a person that they allocate a certain position give money give position give title and then say well this person said that or that person said that because mm. you know for example when it comes to elections across the world it's always usually a link to the carter center uh, of having uh, observers sent over to look out and see if that election is uh, a democratic one or not and uh, by by mere uh, uh audacity uh, by the United States of America, it doesn't allow international observers into its own electoral process, which has been uh, accused of being rigged several times so far, especially in the past uh, 15 years. So the issue for me was not only to get officially invited by the government in Venezuela to take part in this, but to uh, be present at such an important uh, crossroad uh, in the history of Venezuela and the uh, history of the Bolivarian Revolution and the uh, Chavistas and what they have uh, really done to their own communities and the, the shockwaves that they send across the world uh, of how a determined people can take over their own lives and uh, bring the best out of it. And being there uh, allowed me to be in touch with people, especially people who uh, work two or three jobs per uh, 
in, in their and at the moment working two or three jobs, usually they would work only one job as because of the sanctions and the economic hardships. They would have to go and work several jobs, uh, similar to what's going on in Syria and Lebanon. But in Venezuela, it's tougher than that because it uh, it it has an, an impact on uh, how people uh, not only find uh, ev- like uh, uh, ends meet, but it also impacts how the government try to give the best kind of service for its people because it is a socialist uh, government. It is a government that works for the people, by the people, meaning uh, what you find in Venezuela at the level of uh, zero homelessness, or if not zero, at least a very low rate of homelessness because the government has been giving housing to people. So far, Maduro himself have, has given 5,100,000 uh, uh, houses for uh, family uh, units across Venezuela, and he promised uh, that within uh, the upcoming uh, year, uh, maximum two years, he will be giving 2.5 million new homes. I mean, if you if you like if you listen to the numbers, Vanessa, in Lebanon we are five million Lebanese. He already yeah. housed five million one hundred thousand, mm. and he could have housed us mm. along with uh, with refugees who, who fled their countries. So the, mm. the this this is a very important aspect of uh, to look at it because it's not only that aspect is it's the multiple services that are provided by the government after uh, Chavez took over and after he brought back the uh, government in service of the people, made the institutions work in service of the people. And uh, someone might listen to what I'm saying and say, well, you are sent in as an international observer, yet you are speaking as if you're speaking on behalf of the government. I would say the same thing if I go to Syria, because I'm not coming from an unbiased situation. I am biased as heck. (laughs) I cannot be unbiased. It's like asking me to be biased with what's happening in the genocide in Gaza. Absolutely not. It's like asking me to to not take sides when it's between Cuba and America. Who said that I cannot work as an international observer and observe and see if there were any uh, fraudulent votes or if there were any rigged votes and not also root for the people and for their revolution? Absolutely. This has nothing to do with that. I am part of uh, the community that supports the resistance in Lebanon, but at the level of the corruption, at the level of the institutions, if there's some sort of corruption or some sort of ill practice towards the people's, my voice is the loudest and people know that. And this does not negate the other as if I'm going to be standing against the resistance because it is allied with a couple of corrupt people inside of Lebanon. Of course not, but I'm going to be voicing. I'm going to saying I'm discontent with it. It's the same thing when I'm anywhere across the world. So the issue that I touched in Venezuela was uh, the, um, the awareness Vanessa, of the people. They are aware of what they are, who they are, how their government is trying to deal with the imposed sanctions and what the United States of America is trying to do to create this sort of armed resistance, uh, what they call as an armed resistance, but it is an armed uh, guarimberas who are uh, uh, basically being paid. Uh, the last, the latest report that I was reading yesterday, they were being repaid, uh, each person, $150 per day by the United States of America to basically just burn down the country. And uh, up until yesterday, there's a report that says that the government has already um, uh, arrested around 2,000 people. And some people would say, oh, the freedoms, oh, the uh, the people's, the freedom of expression. Oh, really? What's happening in the UK? Why is the government arresting those who are trying to wreak mm-hmm. havoc in the country? Is it halal for them and haram for other people? I mean, the hypocrisy. So I had to be there and I had to see it and I had to experience it and talk to people and, and visit uh, neighborhoods and visit polling stations and uh, sadly on the day of the elections the thir- the final polling station I couldn't go on anymore because I was receiving information that the uh, airport in Lebanon is shutting down uh, not the airport but the the uh, air the uh, flights are being canceled to Beirut uh, that was before the uh, Fuad Shakur assassination uh, but it was um, due to certain a heightening tension between uh, Lebanon and the occupation entity. And I also had another information saying that Belgium, France, the UK, the US, uh, Kuwait, and a couple more Arab uh, states were asking their um, people to leave Lebanon. So I got really um, stressed and I had to start reporting about that and follow uh, with that and follow with uh, also my family back here in Beirut and then follow through with the travel agency to try and... Uh, so I, I was I was uh, taken 
uh, by this information the very last day, the very last center we we uh, uh, we were visiting. You could see that in the thread that I opened because I opened a thread uh, the day of the elections. Every site, every center that we um, uh, went to, I was giving a report about the center and what we saw, what happened, and how the people, uh, what their aspirations are, and what they think about the process, and why are they taking uh, participating. Um, in this uh, elections, but the last one I was fully engaged with what was happening in Lebanon, and uh, later on when we went back to uh, the uh, hotel uh, on the road, it was, everything was normal. Everything was in it. You could you would be reading. I, I opened like um, Western mainstream media and was reading them, and I was literally on the road in Caracas, and I was reading that. Oh my God, people are dying on the streets. And I'm looking around. There's nothing happening. What are they talking about? It was ridiculous to a point that it is truly funny. And uh, that was the day of the elections. Now at night when the results were uh, being announced, uh, there was a lot of talk about how uh, there was gunshots in Caracas and people are shooting at one another. We were actually having a very uh, fine, uh, uh, calm dinner outside in the hotel i could hear absolutely nothing but on the uh, second day yes things were a bit uh, uh, uneasy on the second day when we went to the cne uh, to, uh, to to listen to the announcement to the official announcement by the government in the presence of president maduro of him uh, be, uh, being elected president uh, after the full count was uh, uh, was done and after the cne released the statistics of the elections uh, we felt that that day was a bit different uh, the roads it was a monday the roads were open, but shops were not. Uh, there were no really people in the streets. I think people were a bit afraid of what might happen because the uh, uh, opposition leaders at that time said that uh, or th during the night, they said that they don't accept the election results and that it's fraud and at the uh, uh, extremities of Venezuela at the cities that are far away from Caracas. There were some uh, clashes happening. They even killed one man, uh, burned down the, the building, the, 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 the house that he was in. They killed him inside of it. It was a very stressing um, information that I read earlier in the morning on Monday uh, that happened the night before. Uh, so we felt things were different, but we went to the CNE and we listened to what the President Maduro had said and everyone else, uh, I'm sure, listened to him. And then um, we were put on buses to head back to the uh, hotel. And mm. when we did head back to the hotel, the streets were very suspicious. Absolutely no one on the streets, just police. Uh, we got there, we got there safely, nothing happened. But when I was in the hotel, I could hear a couple of gunshots and I started reading the news because uh, we had created several um, social media groups uh, amongst the uh, uh, international observers and uh, amongst the uh, attaches from the government as well to keep up with the news that's happening and to stay alert uh, for everything, for all the, the new schedule that was being um, presented to us on a daily basis. So on these groups, uh, we started uh, talking to other people in different hotels because we were, I think we were um, spread on four or five hotels. So we had friends in different hotels in different areas of Caracas, and they were telling us that, that they were hearing gunshots. We, in, uh, in the hotel that we were at, uh, um, it was called Euro Building, uh, we, we didn't hear anything, and it was just beside a helicopter airport. We mm. really didn't hear anything. But uh, later that evening, it was like... Um, Maybe 5 or 6 p.m. in the afternoon, just before sunset, I heard a couple of gunshots and then I read uh, in the news that uh, 23 uh, members of the uh, police were shot. Who's shooting at them? Members of the so-called opposition. So they are armed and they want to take revenge because they couldn't uh, turn the ballot boxes in their favor. Uh, that night... Um, we uh, went to bed early because we had a flight on Tuesday, very early on Tuesday. So we went to bed early. I woke up in the middle of night reading uh, some news and I read that uh, the government and the army uh, was doing sweeping arrests against people who were uh, armed. Uh, and causing trouble and setting fires and setting roadblocks and whatnot. 
uh, to a certain point that one of the groups that were returning to Argentina uh, on Monday morning, they were returned uh, halfway. So when we were at the CNE on Monday, apparently a group of us was returning home on their way to the airport, but they were returned because one of the roads was blocked. So I was a bit concerned that I might not make it to the hotel, to the airport, but I was reassured by the attaches that this was taken care of and the people who uh, were uh, supposedly leaving, uh, they were able to delay their flight and they made it back to the airport. So I was relieved mm -hmm. a bit. And then uh, the, the next day, we just went normally uh, on schedule to the airport. And the airport is like an hour or an hour and 15 minutes away from the heart of Caracas, which, by the way, is absolutely beautiful. It's a <laughs> heaven on earth. It's absolutely amazing. I enjoyed every scenery that I saw. So we went back to uh, La, Guara, uh, La Guara, which is uh, where the, the uh, airport is. And um, we were waiting for our flight. It was a bit delayed because of the airline itself. We had a flight coming over from Istanbul. It was late in Istanbul, so it was it had nothing uh, to do with, with with what was uh, with what happened the night before in Caracas, uh, and everything was uh, you know, uh calm. And we mm -hmm. just waited. Uh, when the delay happened, uh, I wa I had the good company of very good friends like. Uh, Professor Tim Anderson and Professor Mohamed Marandi, who uh, actually I, I didn't get to meet during this day. I just met once when we had a gala oh. dinner together. But and then we met all uh, through like hours and hours at the airports because we had the same flights back to the region. Uh, and then we we uh, we each uh, departed our ways when we reached to Istanbul. But it was very important for us to meet and talk and uh, exchange our thoughts and our discussion towards what what, what happened and how our experiences were. And it was. Um, truly uh, a very nice experience. I would do it again in a heartbeat, uh, but not fly that far uh, when we have war <laughs> at our part of the world. Because when we were boarding Vanessa, I, yeah, it was um, 1 p.m. in Caracas. It was 7 p.m. in Beirut and uh, Zionist Israel bombed that building. We were literally yeah. at the door, at the door of the airplane to board coming back. I'm not a person that is afraid, but I'm a mother, Vanessa. So I'm 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 worried what my kids are thinking, what they felt, did they hear? Was it too much for them? That's the only thing that was bothering me. And we couldn't every time something happens in Lebanon, uh, when there is something uh, security wise that's not working properly, all com telecommunications get cut off. And that's very, very annoying. You, you can't get hold of your people. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it was a bit um stressing for me but the, thankfully I had internet on board of the plane uh, so that helped me connecting with my uh, family and with people from the region again and to answer a couple of questions on uh, social media um, direct messages and um, in the middle of the flight like uh, it was seven it was so six hours after the attack on Beirut we were, uh, I think we were above um, Spain, if I'm not mistaken. It's either Spain or Tunisia. I, I can't really remember because I was, by then, I was too tired and about to sleep. And then I wake up to a shocking sound uh, coming out of uh, Professor Marandi. He was, uh, he was, uh, and he, yeah. he took a gas, he gasped and he's, a, and he was like, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi I, I looked. Past, I'm like, what's what's happening? What's what's wrong? And he said, he, I, I think I was the first person <laughs> to ever know what happened because he had connection uh, on board the plane yeah. and he, he was receiving messages from Iran. So uh, I received. He told me that uh, uh, martyr Ismail Hani has been assassinated inside of Tehran, and we were stressed to 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 a level of, you know, it, undeniable stress because we were midair. On the way to Istanbul, meaning that there there might be no more flights to Beirut, no more flights to Tehran. We were stressing so hard, and actually, it was it was Professor Tim who was calming us down. I'll be very honest. So uh, we we tried to calm down, and I called Beirut. It was it was two a.m. in Beirut, and I woke up uh, my family. I was like. Svanania has been hit. And my <laughs> my husband was like, uh, no, 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 fake news. I was like, wake up, man. He's been, he, the man was killed. 
It, and it was like the news then uh, spread like wildfire. And you can imagine how important of a figure yeah. Ismail Haniyeh is to be assassinated inside of such an important sovereign mm. state like Iran, who is biggest animosity uh, or its biggest uh, uh, foes in the region are the illegal U.S. presence and the, and the Israeli entity. So you can imagine that, that those like it was between. I think 30 to 36 hours of complete excruciating stress and pain till we all get got back to our uh, countries. And I'll be very honest. I'm never going to leave until this war is over. I, I cannot handle being yeah. so, so under stress of not being back with my family in time because the last plane on Turkish Airlines that la- landed in Lebanon had a lot of Lebanese people who were waiting at the airport for four days, Vanessa, because their flights kept being canceled. So I, I think God was very good to me that my flight wasn't canceled. It was just delayed a couple of hours, and then I was back home in Lebanon. Uh, so you can understand the stress plus the education that I went through in Venezuela, which was amazing, uh, such an amazing experience. But I don't think I'm ever going to leave the country before this war is over. <laughs> I mean, actually, you know, I, I'm I'm not from the region, but even I feel this way. You know, I'm supposed to be going somewhere in October. I'm already thinking, well, if this all escalates, there's no way I'm leaving because the last thing I want to happen is that I get stuck in the UK or anywhere in the West and I can't get back to what I consider to be my spiritual home, which is Syria, you know. And yeah. to my to my uh, four legged family here and my friends and and my home and so on. So I I completely I can maybe not a hundred percent, but I can definitely relate to what you're saying and you know the the, the level of stress um, that you must have felt. I know because I messaged you after you got home and um, yeah. you conveyed it very clearly to me so I'm just you know (laughs) very glad for your safety and the safety of your family and I'm glad that said Mohammed Morandi got home safely also because yeah it was a very um, you know we've had a lot of shocks since October the 7th but this really was uh, in a, in a very short a period one. of time, two yeah. major earthquakes. And remember, no, no, it's not only Iraq. two. They, 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 yeah. Exactly in That's Iraq, the, the U.S. Uh, Air Force uh, took out four leaders in Iraq in the public mm-hmm. mobilization forces, and it came just ten days after the big hit in Hodeida. So Israel yeah. was just poking around. Vanessa, they want a war. They ask for it. They will have it. Mm. Yeah, and of course Syria is permanently getting, you know, bombarded and and. <laughs> Uh, also internally punched by Israeli proxies, Israeli, U.S., Turkish, U.K., EU, Gulf state proxies that are still um, attempting to stir the cauldron inside Syria itself. Um, But I wanted to talk about um, the Secretary General of Hezbollah, uh, uh, Said Hassan Nasrallah, and his speech uh, yeah. that uh, just finished actually that was yep. one of the main reasons that I wanted to talk to you unfortunately yeah. I lost my live stream to press tv about halfway through but I was following on social media you know people that were summarizing what he was saying but for me one of the most important things um, that he spoke about very early on was this existential war the fact that The war that the resistance is fighting is to preserve the Palestinian state or the idea of the Palestinian state and and to also preserve um, Al-Aqsa. But but the main thing is is what he's saying is if the Zionist entity and its mafia allies win this war, there will be no Palestinian and there will be no Palestine. And there will be an aggressive... Or illegal, um, genocidal entity forever on Lebanon's doorstep and on Syria's doorstep also on, you know, on the entire region's doorstep among those countries that have resisted any kind of normalizations or, or even recognition of the Zionist entity. So can you, um, 
can you talk about how important this is? Because, um, you know, he, he was very forceful when he yeah. spoke about this. And I think that's a clear message that can also be translated well um, yeah. to Western audiences, how serious this battle is. Well, um, let's let's take from what he said. Uh, mm-hmm. He said a couple of sentences that were uh, very important messages to uh, Zionist Israel. Those messages were not for us because since the day of the funeral of a uh, martyr leader, uh, a martyr commander, uh, Sayyid Mohsen Fuad Shukr, uh, we knew that there will be a retaliation because Sayyid Hassan has been saying this for the past what twenty four years since two thousand and six. So it's no, it's for the past, I'm sorry, 18 years. He's been saying this for the past 18 years since 2006, when he always said that um, what happened in 2006 cannot be repeated because if you bomb Beirut, we will bomb what you consider as your capital, which is Tel Aviv. Uh, So he's been saying this for the past like 17, 18 years, and you would expect him to renege on his vow when it comes to uh, them bombing Beirut now. Since the beginning of the war, since October 8, Hezbollah has not been targeting anything except uh, military bases. And Sayyid Hassan reassured this in this speech today. But since then, he's been saying that there are red lines. And if you cross the red line, we'll cross ours. And they crossed a very big red line. If you remember, I'm going to just um, like remind the people who are listening to us, because I know that you remember. Uh, during the funeral on, um, was it on Thursday? Was it on, I'm not going to, uh, was it on right, Tuesday, Wednesday? Yeah, it was on Thursday. So during the, the um, funeral, he said that um, Zionist Israel did not only attack uh, and assassinate a commander in Hezbollah. They attacked the capital, Beirut, yeah. number one. Number two, they attacked a residential area. Number three, they killed women and children. And number four, yes, they assassinated one of the biggest commanders in Hezbollah. So it is a uh, four-level retaliation that will happen. And what he said today, and he emphasized, and he said it twice, our retaliation is coming, but it's going to be coming yavash, yavash, if you saw that video. Easy, (laughs) easy, step by step. We decide when, how, and where. But he said, and that's the sentence, it will be a strong um, rocking, muzalzil, it's strong rocking, uh, reply that is equal to the rocking that happened to Beirut. It's not allowed for the Zionist entity to hover over the capital and commit a crime, a war crime, and for the resistance to stay put and then uh, just submit to the pressure that's been happening. They kill us. They've been killing us for the past 10 months. Complete genocide in Palestine. And they have the audacity to send their ambassadors to the resistance to tell them, oh, please, just calm down. Just uh, don't uh, act in an angry way. Don't overre- overreact. Overreact. We're dealing with war criminal genocidal entities here. What do you mean? Don't over- They took an actual decision to attack Iran in the capital, Tehran, by taking out one of its biggest guests. What is that? Is that not the declaration of war? What is that? They they want us to accept to be disfigured, dismembered, annihilated, killed, uh, starved, uh, uh, put in, um, uh, in refugee camps and then bombed under refugee camps to bomb our capitals, kill our families, decimate our towns on the border with occupied Palestine and then say, Okay, we will be patient. Hell no, we will not be patient. We have every right to defend ourselves and every right to defend our neighbors. And if they don't like it, then they should not be sending shipments 11,000 kilometers from Washington to Tel Aviv to reimburse Mr. Netanyahu with new uh, weaponry that is being uh, experimented on our heads and the heads of our children. What kind of a delusional world are they living in? So what Sayyid Hassan Nasrullah said today was very important. One, he repeated it twice. He said, our retaliation is coming. And he said something that's very important that falls under both uh, warfare, uh, 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 psychological warfare and actual threat. He said, we might do it alone and we might have a coordinated attack that happens all at once at the same moment. 
people went for I could hear people like I was watching from my house and I could see that the area where Sayyid was giving his speech it's called the Mujama Sayyid Shada is in the heart of Dahi it's a very very big area where usually yeah uh, I, I uh, went there once speech. with you yeah if you remember. exactly yes yes yeah. we did that so he, that's it's not only that I could hear people outside my window cheering in the streets listening to him when they they heard him saying we might do it alone or we might do it in a uh, retaliation um, in a coordinated uh, shared retaliation with the axis of resistance because people are fed up Vanessa they are fed up khalas, khalas, da- death, destruction, genocide children being dismembered babies without heads look like, ya Allah beheaded babies they, they're speaking about beheaded babies on October 7th we never saw a face we never saw an image we never had a name we have video live HD video of our people being decimated crushed under their buildings and no one says a thing. Hey, khalas, don't say a thing. We don't need you to say a thing. We are fully capable of saying everything. So uh, b- before we lost the connection, Vanessa, I was telling you that one of the uh, Kuwaiti newspapers, it's called Al Jarida, which literally translates to newspaper. It printed a um, uh, a piece two days ago saying that there is a uh, delegation from the United States of America that landed secretly in Tehran and had negotiations with the regime. In the- I was like, what, what, what are you talking about? Why? <laughs> what? But I mean, first of all, they don't need to do that because ever since the October 7 uh, Al-Aqsa flood operation, there's, there has been uh, actual indirect negotiations between um, the Americans and the Iranians uh, at the level of uh, consultants in Oman. And it was happening before we lost the late um, uh, Iranian president, President Raisi, and um, Foreign Minister Amir Abdullah Yan. Uh, so it was, they were already talking. They didn't stop talking. They never stopped talking. So why would an American delegation land in Iran? So there you go. There's the big propaganda showing that, oh, look, the Americans are trying to play the diplomacy, even going all the way secretly to Iran to try to stop them from. Wallahi, Anjad, really? Really? <laughs> An assassination? Can you imagine? People don't understand what, 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 at what level this assassination is. I'm going to tell you. It is equal because at, at the moment, and ever since October 7, no one in the world gives way to Mahmoud Abbas anymore. He's no longer the president of the, the uh, Palestinian Authority. Uh, he's in his own world, yes, but he no longer represents anything. And the, the, uh, the evidence is the negotiation <coughs> table is between the Israeli entity and Hamas and the other factions of the uh, uh, Palestinian resistance who are fighting inside of Gaza. So the actual president... In, in emotion, emotional president and active negotiation president is, uh, was uh, leader Ismail Haniyeh. So what happened in Iran, it's equal uh, the United States of America having a, a European president over as a guest for the inauguration of their own president after elections. And then uh, Iran going all the way, sending uh, its missiles or whatever kind of technology it had and killed that uh, president, European president, in the safe house inside of Washington. That is something that they cannot never imagine because they believe that they are way be above uh, being targeted or, uh, uh, oh, no, there are the uh, leaders of the free world. It's the land of the free and the land of democracy. And it's all crap, I'm sorry to say. But when it happens in in Iran, it's OK. It's a legitimate, a legitimate target. Can you please tell me what kind of other uh, country on this planet legitimizes assassinations other than besides Israel? It's actually mm-hmm. against international law, and Israel reinstated it in 2002 because they think that they are above everyone else. They are, you know, they are the chosen people, you know. Uh, but God chose them for some reason. I don't know what. It's maybe because he likes genocidal entities. So what the issue is, uh, what happened in Iran was a major, major mistake for Israel because it, it's sending a triple message. One, taking out the most important man for this conflict at the moment, Ismail Hini too, doing it in Tehran, telling the Iranians that we can do whatever we want over your airspace, killing your people. And third, telling the world and their own people that, look, we are bringing you victories from across the region. What kind of victory is it when you are taking out a man who was officially invited to a, a very important event in a sovereign state when you can't even, after 10 months of genocide, stop the missiles that are being fired at you 
from Gaza towards the illegal colonial settlements. What kind of victory are you talking about? You genocidal mm-hmm. maniac. What kind yeah. of victory do you think that you have achieved by taking out the uh, top commander in uh, the military in Hezbollah uh, while knowing that the man has uh, a deputy and his deputy has a deputy and his deputy has a deputy deputy and that it cannot stop the resistance from uh, completely uh, annihilating any existence of your settlers on the border between Lebanon and occupied Palestine. That hasn't mentioned this. He said for the first time in history, in history between the Lebanese and the Israeli struggle, we see that 210,000 settlers left their homes. It's usually us who are displaced. It's our homes that are uh, decimated. It's our people that are killed. It's our uh, uh, institutions that are burned down. But this time it is equal. Every house that gets decimated in Lebanon, we see an equally decimated house on the occupied Palestinian land. Every civilian that is being killed, we saw an equal civilian in it. Every martyr in the resistance, we saw a, a soldier being uh, uh, um, either uh, dro- seeing like a guided missiles dropping on them or being fired at with uh, uh, Burkan rockets and whatnot. So it is reciprocation. So why wouldn't it be? Why wouldn't it be a reciprocation uh, after such an attack on the capital Beirut and on the capital Tehran? I look. I truly believe it's going to be something that like we've never experienced before. I truly believe mm. this because you remember we spoke about this after the April 14 um, retaliation yeah. by Iran against the uh, uh, aggression in the uh, uh, Damascus, the, the Iranian uh, consulate. Yeah, we spoke about this and we saw that it is historic. It's unprecedented even though it's, it was just like 300 rockets and only nine of them uh, made it through because of the seven layers of protection that Israel had from the US, UK, France, uh, uh, Jordan, UAE, Jordan. Saudi Arabia <laughs> and them yeah. as well and their Iron Dome. So, but it was announced i mean even now i was i was kidding with my uh, friends uh, just last night iranian friends i was telling them like guys couldn't you do something like without saying i mean like israel went over tehran and bombed you guys without you knowing right and you need to retaliate and we were laughing it was like late at night and we were having a discussion i was like why why do you keep telling them that you're gonna bomb stop telling them that you're gonna bomb them but the issue is they were telling me that this is part of the psychological warfare and they are saying that they are being prepared by their government that the the retaliation will be bigger than anyone has ever expected Mm. i would be lying I would be lying to you if I tell you that I was not, uh, uh, I did not have a pleasant surprise when I heard that. Mm. Because it's about time someone put a leash on Israel. And we all know that a leash without power will never stay put. It will break. If the resistance doesn't retaliate against this horrific act of terrorism against the capital Beirut, then Israel will start using our airspace again to not only assassinate, but also to terrorize the public. Mm. Remember when in 2017, Syria downed an F-16 for them? Yeah. Since then, have they ever flown an F-16 above Syria? Uh, when they want to bomb Syria, where do they stand? They did once uh, when they targeted right. uh, Aleppo by going uh, by yeah. bypassing the uh, batteries uh, that are installed in the Golan Heights. They went all the way to the desert from Jordan. Remember yeah. that? And yeah, they did it so fast. Jordan and Al Tanif. It was twice. Yes, actually, they, they yes. attacked twice. Um, yeah, but why? Why wouldn't of... they go over Damascus and over the Golan? Because their plane was down, and they learned a lesson. This is how you deal with Israel. If you don't hit hard, they will take it as a routine and continue their aggression and even escalate their aggression. And that is absolutely forbidden to happen in Lebanon. Yeah, I mean, I um, I just wanted to interject there as well, because it was interesting for me that uh, Nasrallah mentioned um, Syria, of course, in a, in a very um, brotherly way. Um, yeah. considering Syria to be, um, you know, to a large degree, the land bridge for the resistance, but also um, the, the heart of the resistance in the region and, and a country that has fought the last 13 years um, as a result of their solidarity for Palestine and for Hezbollah and their refusal to relinquish that solidarity. And I thought it was really interesting. I mean, 
I have been told by a couple of people here at least that after the 7th of October, Syria and uh, Hezbollah spoke and Syria said, look, we can release, um, you know, a formation, a military <clears throat> brigade, a military formation yeah. to help. And um, Nostrala there's no need for that. Clear. He yeah. said there's yeah. no need. And, and because yeah. Syria has multiple fronts still inside Syria yeah. that it has to uh, clear Stay up. Stay alert. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and to end prior yeah. to any major confrontation um, with uh, the Zionist entity. And people need to understand this, you know, because oh, I'm tired of this endless questioning. Why doesn't Syria do this? Why doesn't no, no, Russia no. do Look, this? Look, I will, I, will never, I will never get tired because people need to get educated because they have yeah. not been following, Vanessa, uh, the war for the past 14 years the way that mm. we've been following. So I educate, by, ed by but I do it like a snake. I, I do it while <laughs> like spitting poison at them. But I do it because <laughs> I'm sorry to say that, but I'm, I'm an angry woman. People need to understand that. <laughs> it's fine. That's the trauma <laughs> that I go through because I was, I was uh, raised in wartime. So it's, you have to, you have to bear with me. I'm angry. Even I'm, if I'm educating you, sometimes I'm, I'm going to be spitting fire. So I do that while spitting fire, but um, I tell them that uh, you can't uh, ask a state that has been fighting 82 other terrorist entities supporting uh, uh, factions on the ground with all sorts of weapons that are top notch uh, with one goal to decimate the country, to completely mm. make the country unlivable and to uh, take any um, um, light, uh, to take out any light uh, at the end of the tunnel for Syria. That's not possible. But Syria has been part of this since the very beginning. I mean, yeah. where did Hamas reside before they moved to Qatar, before Qatar kicked them out? Yeah, exactly. In Damascus. Huh? <laughs> exactly. Where did the weapons that Hezbollah brought and then uh, miraculously uh, um, was able to transport to Gaza, where did they mm -hmm. come from? Syria. Syria. Okay, then where is the weapons that Hezbollah is deliberately showing in his videos by the military uh, media coming from? He deliberately showed footage of weapons made in Syria by the Syrian Arab army mm -hmm. because people keep tend to they, they, they keep forgetting that um, we are one. Whether they like it or not, we already broke Sykes-Picot. We are no longer committing to the borders that they drew for us. So when Lebanon is retaliating in reality, in actual reality, it is Syria and Lebanon retaliating. Yeah. When Iraq bombs occupation forces inside of Syria, it is both Syria and Iraq retaliating. We no longer approve of those lines that were drawn by Mr. Sykes and Mr. Picot. Absolutely not. So people who keep saying what is the role of Syria should uh, educate themselves, uh, read a bit, analyze a bit, and maybe uh, find a chair, sit, and shut up about it. <laughs> because we will continue to educate them, but we will not be nice while, be, while doing it. Khalas, it's about yeah. time they learn. Khalas. <laughs> Well, I think the other point to make also, of course, is that Syrian territory is open to all the resistance factions to operate from. Yeah. Um, this is also something people don't understand. You know, when the Iraqi resistance is hitting the Golan Heights, where do you think they're hitting it from? Not yeah. from Iraq, from yeah. inside Syria. And where, where did the Hezbollah balloon that was down like a, yesterday yeah, exactly. uh, or the day before, where did, where did the people down it from or the resistance mm -hmm. down inside Syria? Yeah, I mean, exactly. who is who is bombing Syria over the past 14 years? Israel. Yeah. Why are they bombing Syria? Because it is the backbone of the resistance. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, as uh, said, Morandi has said to me many times and in many interviews, if Syria had been broken, um, the, the resistance would not be broken, but it would be severely damaged. But the importance of Syria to that entire resistance uh, channel and access is, is you know, you, it's indescribable. Um, uh, Vanessa, I met people, I met people who had no idea that uh, Daesh, ISIS, and Nusra were inside Lebanon. 
that they infiltrated the border between Syria and Lebanon and they mm. were inside Lebanon, which yeah. pushed the Lebanese army, the resistance and the uh, Syrian Arab army to join forces and yeah. liberate the region. People had no yeah. idea that it would have taken like a month for Daesh to reach the Mediterranean. They don't know how aggravated and mm. complicated the situation was. Hezbollah mm. lost more than 2,000 fighters. 2,000. Lebanon is so tiny. Do you know what 2,000 is? Com- mm. Compared to the, to the uh, number of fighters that were brought in from all across the world, terrorists, to wreak havoc, havoc in Syria. How many thousands did Syria pay in the Syrian Arab army to liberate those areas? How yeah. many fine men did Syria lose because of this terrorism that is sponsored by the United States of America and by Israel? Why did those terrorist entities take away the land that was completely bordering uh, occupied Palestine first? Because they needed yeah. to protect Israel, because they were put there to protect Israel. They were getting medical treatment in uh, field hospitals that, uh, mm-hmm. that are owned and operated by Israel. I mean, come on. If people still don't know this, they don't know how important it is that uh, Hezbollah entered the war, uh, again, the global war in Syria to defend Lebanon first and to help the Syrians second. It was not the other way around. We were getting bombarded and killed. We were, we were surviving terrorist bombings inside of Beirut. Mm-hmm. That is the main reason to made Hezbollah go and help out Syria. Because if your neighbor's house is on fire, what do you think will happen to your house? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think what people also need to understand, and I think what this current situation is demonstrating, um, I mean, now you have, if you like, the perception in the West, Iran is the head of the Shiite Muslim community, right, globally. And here it is coming to avenge effectively one of the main leaders in the Sunni Sunni Muslim global community and Hezbollah inside Syria in the early years it was defending uh, many of the Christian communities in Malula yes. in Sadnaya uh, later in El Skelbiye in uh, Mechade, um mm-hmm. you know and this is what people need to understand is that this isn't some kind of um, Islam versus Judaism you know, this isn't some kind of binary battle that's going on here. It's, it's, it's no, it was natives than, against the yeah. proxies coming over to take over and kill as many natives as possible. Yeah. Um, and, and the fact that this unity is what is being also Yemen. You know, Yemen yeah. is, is, is uh, Zaidi and, and Shafi. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, again, it's always portrayed as, as these sectarian. As being uh, Shias. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it isn't. You know, no. the entire resistance axis in Yemen is made up of, of multiple movements and political parties. I used to I used to joke about it um, before the people get got, got to know what Yemen is and who the Yemeni people are. I used to joke about it and tell them, look, if you go to a Zaidi Yemeni and tell them you're Shia, you're going to be punched in the face. People used to laugh at it. But now after they saw what it's Yemen true. was capable of doing, they believe. They finally believe. Uh, yeah. Oh my goodness, I remember, do you remember years ago when um, we were trying to put together the press delegation to go yeah. to Yemen? I can't remember which year it was, 2017 maybe? And I think, I I think uh, at the, the beginning Vanessa, of the liberation of Aleppo, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, um, and you said to me, Vanessa, even Hezbollah is not afraid of uh, Ansrullah, but they respect Ansrullah yeah. being like one of the most fearsome. Yeah. Uh, uh, fighting um, factions in the world today. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. they are. They are 100, 110%. And the people, <laughs> oh my God, since October yeah. 7, every Friday, millions, they never get bored. They never get tired. They never get scared. It's amazing. I'm mm-hmm. doing oh. that trip and I hope it's soon. Yeah, well, take me with you, please. I time. will. I will. That would be a great, <laughs> great experience. <laughs> um, I just wanted to finish up. I mean, yes, there, there, there has been a lot of talk and a lot of speculation, <laughs> um, especially on social media, um, about exactly what is going to happen. You know, some are saying 
and Shrullah will attack oil fields because mm-hmm. Israel attacked Hodeida and, and the oil yeah. uh, refineries there and Iran is going to attack, um, you know, maybe Tel Aviv. It, it, so everyone is kind of speculating, is it going to be a combined effort? Is it go- what is it going to be? Well, and in your opinion, Hassan, also, you have any he picked idea? up that. No, well, I have absolutely no idea. But um, <laughs> even if I did, I'm not going to say that I have. Oh, but I the issue is, I truly don't know. But as I told you, Vanessa, what Sayyid Hassan Aslah said, um, uh, it was absolute psychological warfare. He said, and, and you could you could see it in his body language, saying mm-hmm. we could do it alone, we could do it in a group, and share and coordinate, and he's like killing them softly so it's 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 a uh, very important to understand that one retaliation will happen two from everyone on board because everyone was hit, was hit equally and in large uh, uh in a large sense meaning leaderships and commanders and an entire area i mean in in Hodeida it was if i'm not mistaken it's more than 90 wounded and I think yeah. uh, it's 18 or 20 martyred. I mean, mm-hmm. these are humans. These are, these are not numbers. Yeah. And yeah. Yemen has every right to defend itself. So we're talking about a ter- retaliation that will absolutely happen. That's number one. Number two, it will happen across the geography of, of occupied Palestine. Hmm. it's not needed for everyone to attack Tel Aviv. There's no need for that. Yeah. And Sarullah can be uh, targeting the southern part. Hezbollah can take care of uh, the capital. And Iran might take care of something much more valuable for the uh, Zionist entity than we ever think. It can be facilities. It can be airports. It can be ports, it can be anything that we saw on that Hupo video, on the Hood Hood video. Mm-mm. Remember those three episodes? Yeah. It can literally be anything there. And um, <clears throat> I think like, a lot of people are saying that after this attack, retaliatory attack, uh, in a globe, uh, like a regional war will, will, uh, will ignite. Mm-hmm. I have a different opinion. And this is the first mm-hmm. time I say it. I think that after this retaliation, everyone will be ready to sit and talk uh, because it's, it's about time. Look, we're, we're talking about all of this and the escalations and whatnot, but we are always missing the point, not intentionally, but because of how things are escalating. Gaza mm-hmm. is the main point. Yeah. How much more can the people of Gaza take? It's devastating. Yeah. It's It's so heartbreaking. It's so painful. And no... Uh, uh, in modern history, no nation has taken and, and basically uh, was able to uh, comprehend and accept and be patient the way the people of Gaza have been. You have yeah. videos, millions of videos online that show you desert upon desert. Gaza is Gaza actually has a desert-like um, landscape, but now it has mountains because of the amount of destruction. Mountains. Yeah. People are standing on mountains of destruction, of rubble. And you have hundreds of thousands under the rubble. It's not thousands. The Lancet's yeah. report, which is one of the most uh, respected medical journals in the world, they said that, that, that uh, it was a shy estimate of them saying 186,000. They believe it is more than 200,000 humans. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Can you imagine what the day after will look like? So it's about time for this to end. And I think... Everyone is on board ending it, but each with their own agenda. And I think the only one that needs to be taken out of the, of the scene like ASAP and put in a, uh, a Looney Tune Institute is Netanyahu, the blood warmongering Netanyahu. If there is justice on this planet, someone would have enough dignity to uh, basically put him out of his misery. Yeah. Marwa, I hope, I really hope... Um that you're right um, because, you know, this region needs to have some peace in its lifetime. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and as you said, uh, the priority is stopping the horrific bloodshed in Gaza, but that also, of course, in the occupied territories, in the mm-hmm. West Bank, in the prisons. I mean, my God, 
you know. Um, actually, in a, in a sense, I, I kind of hope that Israel implodes on itself and that you have, you know, the far right, the, the, the ISIS vigilante settlers with Ben Gavir and Smotrich fighting it out with some kind of centrist um, Knesset, you know, really. Um, this is what it, it sort of deserves because it's imposed this level of sectarian division and war and strife and destabilization on the entire region. And that has largely been its purpose, of course, mm-hmm. um, as, a, as a sort of, um, you know, a, a shattering machine for the West to take apart the region and leave the resources for plundering and pillaging. Um, and uh, Israel itself is stealing 30% of its water from the Golan Heights. It's destroying um, water supply in the occupied territories in Gaza where kids are literally collecting rainwater drops. And there's no rain now anyway, um, just to drink clean water. You know, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's just off the scale sadism and Satanism that we're witnessing right now. Um, and to see Netanyahu applauded in the Congress says everything that we need to know about the United States uh, regime and administration, both sides, of course. Um, they've already entertained Nazis in Zelensky, both in the UK and the US. Um, so, you know, you're right. The priority is Gaza, stopping the bloodshed, rebuilding. Um, and in, you know, my wish would be one democratic state of Palestine. Palestine, yeah. Yeah. And the Jews that want to live there under a democratic political system where everyone has equal rights and there is no racism or apartheid or supremacism can stay and the Zionists, most of which have dual nationality anyway, can go back to their con- the countries they came from, frankly. That, you know, that's my wish and I know that that's the wish for most of the people in the region that, that have understood what's going on for, for decades, well actually a century I guess. I absolutely agree, and I couldn't hope for anything um, other than real peace for the people of Gaza, yeah. because what they've been through is just unfathomable. I don't think any people can survive this while being besieged, unable to even flee from war. Yeah. So I just hope for the best, and uh, again, we have a right to retaliate, we have a right to defend ourselves, mm-hmm. and to protect our neighbors as well. We will never give up this right, and um, I think eventually the peoples of this region will reach their goals, uh, whether now or decades from now. This did not start today. It started way early in the 20s, and uh, it's still ongoing, and it is the ramifications and the consequences of this injustice that happened in 1948. And even before 1948, of course. Marwa, thank you so much. Let's... um wait and see what happens in the next few days. Um, do you have any idea on, on time? Do you think it's going to be in one week, in one month? or I honestly I, I don't know, know but I, I don't think it's going to be like in, in one month. No, I'm, I'm, I think it's going to be uh, most probably within this week. But when, I don't know. Well, please stay safe and um, my best as ever to your beautiful family Um, and and my best to you as well and hopefully we meet for the great victory right here in lebanon yes or best in uh, in palestine yes (laughs) that's amazing and definitely go together to yemen that's if you go Uh, without me that's my bucket list no 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 i'm not i'm gonna stay put just stand on the the door of that plane and say i'm not leaving before vanessa comes here Marwa, thanks for talking to me tonight. Thank um, you, my love. And, um, Thank you. Have a great, great pleasure. evening. And, and you. We Definitely. might talk again after the strike happens. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs>
All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.